Um, you've both spoken about the progress that we're seeing um, across newsrooms in this space. Um, I mean, there are obviously very big reasons for companies like Bloomberg, Reuters, the AP to embrace technology, AI, automation, machine learning, all of these things. Um, and we have, you know, resources, we have, um, you know, clear goals around doing that. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how smaller newsrooms are approaching these technologies and, you know, what do you, you know, what do you do if you're kind of a five person newsroom in Leicester? Uh, trying to kind of take on uh, these technological advances. You had a great example of, a, of a, a story in the Express and Star newspaper, which I don't know how you knew this, but that happens to be my hometown oh. of Warsaw. Um, but I'm interested, how, do, how does the smaller newsroom take this stuff on? Uh, it's really tough. Uh, using AI and using computational tools, as I said, is really expensive. Uh, it's really time consuming. So if you are a small five person newsroom, you're really going to have a tough time as compared to a larger newsroom who has more resources. Uh, so I think it's really important to be upfront about that, uh, that it's going to be time consuming and expensive. However, that said, uh, there are lots of really great tools out there that if you can invest a little bit of time and a little bit of money, uh, you, can, uh, you can make some advances. So in automated writing, for example, uh, there are two companies, uh, Narrative Science and Automated Insights, uh, who both have commercially available tools for doing automated writing. Uh, you can uh, really easily build social bots. Uh, you can check out the work of the Quartz Bot Studio. They have a lot of, uh, you guys have tutorials, right? Yeah, they have lots of great tutorials about how can you, uh, you know, really quickly make uh, social bots. Uh, oh, we didn't talk about voice interfaces, but uh, building voice interfaces is much easier than you'd imagine. Uh, so in one of my classes last year, uh, we, built, uh, we built flash briefings uh, for the Amazon Alexa. Uh, in just a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. and I, I kind of want to push back on the, on the premise of the question. Um, I wonder if, the, if there's sort of an assumption there that local news media should be using AI or automation, and I'm actually not sure they should. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the data resources, typically. Uh, they, they may or may not have the, the sort of training in place to be able to, to explore some of these more mm -hmm. advanced techniques. I mean, the model uh, that seems to be working for sort of enhancing uh, local news media in the UK is more of a centralized model. Right. You know, they've they've centralized the um, the the the, uh, the knowledge and the skill to be able to produce those templates, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they're really making use of government data, which is you know data collection is extremely or can be extremely expensive, uh, and then they they're sort of you know acting as a newswire to distribute that. Maybe that's a model that, that's that model. makes more sense, is, mm -hmm. is more of a, a newswire kind of centralized um, hub and spoke model. Rather than a small newsroom thinking that they have to do it to stay relevant. Yeah, and we don't want to put, you know, kind of put this on local news like they have to reinvent all right. of this uh, technical machinery over mm -hmm. and over again. So, you know, maybe there are some opportunities for, for, some, uh, for, for some tool makers, uh, for some larger news organizations to think about. Uh, platforming some of these things uh, to make them more accessible to local media. You've um, both in your presentations given some really great examples of um, technology and how it's being used in the newsroom. Um, but do you, is there anything, I was just wondering from your vantage point, um, with all these various projects going on across all different types of media, from a, from a kind of a news generation perspective, what are you seeing that really stands out? If you were to pick an example of something that you think is really moving the needle, what would you pick? That's a really <laughs> good question. I, I think I've already, uh, I've already said I'm a fan of, uh, I'm a fan of Bloomberg's automated writing. I, one of the things that I'm working on in my next project. Uh, is the question of how will we read today's news on tomorrow's computers? Mm -hmm. Because we're building all of this amazing technology, but it is quickly becoming obsolete. 
So you can launch something on the web today, and then in two years, uh, the underlying technology will have advanced to the point where the thing you put on the web is broken. Right? So our, uh, our incredible interactives that we're building in the data journalism world uh, are, are just disappearing. So I'm really interested in the question of how do we build tools that allow us to effectively archive all of the really interesting cutting edge journalism, uh, cutting edge digital journalism that we're creating today so that we'll be able to read it in 20 years. Because the things that I wrote a decade ago for the web are gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess in terms of moving the needle um, projects, uh, you know, I'm I'm excited about uh, AI and and algorithms that um, maybe are used in uh, less for commoditizing news production and more for helping journalists kind of jump higher uh, and create more uh, unique, original, you know, more comprehensive investigations. And you know, for certain type for certain types of news organizations, I think. Being first and being speedy, and you know, uh, having a, a, a large breadth and and and, and so on, um, is the kind of business model that they're in. But for other news organizations, like producing a more unique investigation, uh, might help bring in uh, subscribers, you know, and, and be more meaningful for, for the community. So I'm sort of looking to those uh, examples that really. Um, uh, enhance the quality of the journalism. Right. Do you think in that sense there's possibly there's, there's a lot of discussion about the topics that we know like earnings and sports, the things that we do produce at scale, do you think in, in some sense there's probably not enough discussion about what we can do to fuel the investigative reporting? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we can talk about the investigative stuff more. I mean, I think, I think you know, we, we shouldn't say let's not, you know, automate sports stories, but uh, one of the examples that I like uh, in Sweden is uh, Klokspark, and they so they automate um, news stories across every level of Swedish soccer, uh, which is pretty cool. It's like you know hundreds and hundreds of games, thousands of games. Mm -hmm. um, but they also have a staff of 14 sports reporters um, who are adding on top of these automatically generated stories, uh, doing reporting, kind of adding a, a bit of spice, a, a bit of uh, humanity back into, into sports reporting. So, you know, I, I think you can sort of produce the co a commodity uh, uh, version here, uh, but make it better by um, sort of smartly uh, integrating people into the, into the process. I wanted to talk a little bit about, you, you both touched on it, about uh, newsroom standards and best practices, transparency. Uh, I think there's been a fair amount of debate ar around those themes with regard to automated coverage. And you know, you know, often when we think about this, or certainly when I think about it, you, you kind of think, you know, it's another area of coverage to which, you know, we should apply the same kind of journalistic principles, the same principles of transparency that we apply to any story. But do you, what do you feel about that? And should there be specific standards, common standards, as relates to automated content? I, th I think I think we should start moving towards some standards, um, or at least some consensus documents. You know, I think that's a question for industry to kind of get together um, and talk amongst um, yourselves and decide, you know, what makes sense in terms of bylining automated content. You know, can we all agree that there's, you know, one preferred way to byline this, con uh, this content? Or is there a preferred way to be more transparent with the use of AI in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an investigation? Um, you know, I, I think that that could be a, a, good, um, uh, a good undertaking for the industry, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that standards are desperately needed. Uh, I don't know if it's actually going to happen, though. Uh, I look at the schema.org project, and I think about the ways that people have tried to use uh, schemas to categorize news, and it's just been kind of a disaster. Uh, so I think that the journalism industry is kind of freewheeling. Uh, we've prided ourselves on being freewheeling for many years. And so one of the real struggles we have in, uh, in integrating more technology uh, is that technology requires this engineering mindset of adhering to standards. And honestly, one of the things that's really interesting about journalism is when it doesn't uh, adhere to standards. All right? It's really interesting when it's not standardized. So, you know, that's kind of the essential struggle at the heart of the endeavor. 
Um, one question that I wanted to get to is uh, around fake news, misinformation, and obviously, we, you know, we have a, a, it's been discussed earlier today at this event, you know, there's an ongoing debate around Facebook, Twitter, uh, the social platforms about what they're doing, what they're not doing um, to um, spread or fight um, misinformation. You know, there was a very interesting interview last week in the New York Times, with the, which I'm sure you saw with the CTO of Facebook, who, who was describing some of the actions that they've taken, some of the challenges um, uh, that they're facing. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what specific actions uh, with technology you think the social platforms should be taking. I think they should um, acknowledge that AI is not going to solve the problem and start hiring people who are going to do the work. I mean, I showed this example of um, fact spotting, right? Technology can sift through massive amounts of text online and draw journalists' attention, fact checkers' attention toward uh, some of the more checkworthy claims there. You've got to have a person actually doing the fact check. That, that's not going to be automated. There's not going to be AI that does a fact check. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't care how far out you go. Uh, there's too much potential context. There's too much potential for deception. Uh, you're always going to need a person verifying and fact checking something. So, you know, uh, the, the whole rhetoric uh, from Facebook that we're getting that, you know, sure, they've hired 30,000 people who are uh, moderating content, but the rhetoric is really about how they're then going to train AI to do all the moderation. And it's just a farce. It's not going to happen. Meredith? Yeah. No, Nick, I think you want to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, and I think it goes back to this fantasy of an automated world, the fantasy of, uh, of autonomous systems that are going to govern everything, this techno chauvinist fantasy. And it's, it's nonsensical. Uh, we do need humans. We also need to pay attention to what are the working conditions of those humans. Uh, so Sarah Roberts has a new book out about commercial content moderation and how it's a really terrible job to evaluate the material that is flagged on Facebook. It is destroying people's psyches. It's destroying people's minds. Uh, there's some work by uh, some of my colleagues at NYU who have developed machine learning models to uh, do a really good job of uh, determining toxicity and slowing down fake news, and they simply haven't been adopted. So I think we really need to uh, look at what are the financial incentives uh, in place to keep uh, toxic content flowing, uh, and how are companies enabling the flow of toxic content in order to make more money. Uh, I think that also, uh, one simple thing that the platforms could do to keep the news media in business is could you know allow them a larger cut of advertising revenue. I think that one thing that individuals can do or corporations can do is you know you can buy ads directly from media organizations. Like that still works. I think we we are out of time. If that, so I think we're over time, but just just one final question to end on. Um, you know, from your um, perspective, how, you know, you talked a lot about the misconceptions around uh, technology, some of the issues that we have around definition. Um, but what's your take? I mean, how do you see attitudes, especially from a journalist perspective, journalists that you're meeting and talking to, how do you see attitudes to technology evolving? Do you think we are getting over the fear factor that exists in journalism around, around AI? Or are we making progress? Well, one of the reasons that I wrote my book was I wanted to empower people around technology. Because I do often get students in my class who say, oh, I went into journalism because I'm not good at math. And so what I say is, you're not actually bad at math. You've just been badly taught. right? And so. We need, uh, we need people to get over their math anxiety, because math anxiety is a real thing. You can Google it. Uh, and so I really want to empower people around computational concepts so that uh, we can make better decisions about what we can and should do with technology. Nick? Yeah, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> 
Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us again, Meredith and Nick. Thank you. Thank you.